This is John Thompson introducing what is in effect a tribute to the memory of Maurice O'Shea of Newcastle, New South Wales. We made this program by talking to a few of the many, many people from all walks of life all over Australia who remember Maurice O'Shea with admiration and affection. Maurice O'Shea was born at the end of the 19th century. He died in 1956. As a boy of 16, he was sent overseas to Montpellier University in France. After graduating, he went to Grignan Agricultural College, and later, for some time, he lectured at Montpellier in analytical chemistry. When he came home to Australia, he took charge of the family vineyards at Pocolbin. He was a cultured, well-read man. I think he was a happy man. Very mild, very hospitable. The fact, uh, you know, that he was able to build up during his lifetime an Australia-wide and, to some extent, an international reputation for uh, the product of his small vineyard at Pocolbin is a remarkable thing, but still more remarkable if you knew the man, because never was there a man with less capacity for personal salesmanship than he had. He was a man who was almost too shy to tell you if uh, you asked him anything about how he did his work. Hal Missingham director of the Sydney Art Gallery. Because he was, he was half French, I think, Morris, and uh, the Maurice part, I expect, and half Irish, the O'Shea part, and, you know, it re really was a combination. Very, very quiet, too, you know, he'd only speak very softly, and uh, he was... Uh, never heard, I, I've never heard Morris say a bad word about anyone or anything, really. He was, he was so mad about his own job and so intent about, on this business of winemaking that... Uh, it's like all good artists and good craftsmen, you know, they just get busy doing the thing that they want to do. He was an extraordinary man, a man you'd very rarely meet in Australia. This is Dr. Alf Conlon. I often used to think while I was talking to him that his deep cultural attitude to food reminded me more of the Chinese outlook than the Australian. His attitude to wine uh, was more like that of a physician. And in one sense of the word, he was a, an entrancing figure to me because he reminded me of something that they had in medieval times. You read in the old books where a trade had a mystery attached to it. Well, there was a mystery in Morris O'Shea. Uh, Morris, of course, was a man with a, a great sense of humour, perhaps a trifle uh, a trifle feline sense of humour. He was dining at the uh, at one of the conservative clubs around here, uh, where he was a member. And I remember him telling me with great glee, not once but twice, that he was dining with a very uh, an ultra conservative man who, at the time, was uh, sharing the common worry of the onrush of communism. And this gentleman uh, leaned over in a in a, with bated breath said, "You know, the the communists are gaining ground here." And Morris said, what, here, in the club? No, 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 says the exasperated man. I mean, exasperated at Morris's stupidity, but because Morris wasn't stupid, he was just having a loan of him. Wasn't How it? would you describe him, David Rubin? Morris is the most, most lovable character I think I've ever met. Morris had very high standards, very high principles, and uh, above all, I've never known him to tell a lie. Mm. But he was a villain just the same, where it came to telling stories or... Or, uh, or playing practical jokes. <laughs> and he's done some very, very villainous things. Yes, I, I think to know a little more about the world of Morris O'Shea, I think we need to understand the two great loves of his life. First of all, there was his love for the vineyard, Mount Pleasant. And that was certainly matched, probably if not surpassed, by his passion for Marcia Singer Fuller, who was to become his wife and muse. When he first met young, this uh, young Marcia, she was playing Chopin, from all accounts, and she was playing it with some considerable artistry. Morris was struck, struck. It was simply love at first sight. Yes, and then, of course, there were the letters. The letters, and in one of these letters, he wrote to Marcia, who at the time, I think, was only 16 or 17, he wrote to her, declaring the extraordinary depth of his love. I want you, <laughs> wrote Morris, more completely than any other lover, 
ever held his loved one. Heaven, I want also to possess even the secrets of your imagination. So, in 1927, they married. And whilst Morris tried very hard to make life attractive for his cultured young wife and their daughter Simone, it was simply impossible. The hardships and isolation of life in the Hunter Valley in those years would eventually drive them apart. Then there was Erwin Page, the singer, who, like so many people, found that to know Maurice O'Shea was uh, well, well to love him. Probably the uh, kindest heart and sweetest smile I've ever seen on a man. But uh, he was he was very strange sometimes about the wines. You. Uh, he was very careful that they didn't get into the wrong hands. What I mean by, should I say, by the wrong palates. Uh, there were three grades. When I f was first introduced to Morris, I, I used to get the black label until he was quite sure that um, I knew how to drink it. And then I graduated into another coloured label. I've forgotten, I think that was the white label. But then, of course, we got when you got into the um, inner sanctum, you got to the label with the uh, picture of Mount Pleasant on it. That was the one. And... Uh, from then on, of course, uh, I was in the inner group, so to speak, but uh, you didn't go along and buy it by the hatful. You, you only got a little bit at a time. <laughs> Erwin Page. Of course, mind you, it was only a small vineyard, and he had a lot of um, personal clientele. Like, actually, the business was built around him as a person more than anything because of his great integrity. If he said a wine was good, uh, well, it was good. And he also had, of course, a little select stock of very good French wines. Well, of course, as soon as you came over and had a look at Pacalman there, there it was nestling there, and it was... Hal missing him again. Quite unlike to imagine a vineyard it'd be. It, was, it had that real Australian sort of flavour about it, too. There was a damn great sort of shed, you know, all whitewashed and corrugated iron. Everybody in it was, you know, working like, like you'd expect people anywhere around Morris to work. They're all pleasant, they're all full of colourful clothes. But the main atmosphere, the main thing you got about um, Morris's place, I think, was this superb sort of homely vineyard set in, in, in this sort of hilly country with the vineyards coming down to it and starting right outside the door. Um, did you ever see him at, at, uh, at vintage time looking after his wines? At vintage time you didn't see Murray attired as you do in the city. Vintage time Murray had an old singlet on, a pair of khaki shorts and a pair of boots and a hat that fitted him maybe. Dr. Alan Way. I don't know where he got the hat from was never the same hat two vintages running and Murray worked with his people. He was a busy boy at vintage time, really a busy boy. Uh, he was in his laboratory, he was out amongst the bushes, sometimes he'd go out to see how the pickers were going, then he'd come in and watch how the pressing was going. He had little individual uh, sections on his vineyard which he used to keep uh, separate from other sections, pick the grapes from that section and process them separately in a very small tank or, or fermenting tank. Uh, uh, later on in the wine's life he would handle those wines separately instead of blending them and he would give them the names of the vineyard which he divided up into various sections. He had. 1937 would prove to be a tumultuous year for Morris and Marcia. It was the year they separated with Marcia and Simone moving to live in Sydney. Yet through all this turmoil, Morris would produce his greatest vintage, the 1937 Mountain A Dry Red. That wine, Morris is reputed to have said, is my heart and soul in a bottle. It is the best wine I will ever make. While they would continue to live apart, Marcia would remain the love of Morris's life. But I have watched him cooking, and uh, it was uh, really an eye-opener to me. And this is Madame Renault. One I remember in particular was uh, a preparation of um, hair. Oh, it, it, it was marvellous. It, it is the best, the, the best preparation of hair I ever tasted anywhere. In the world. This is Douglas Lamb. But Morris uh, uh, said that wine was a drink. It was meant to be drunk and that's all there was to it. And some wines were better than others and his dictum was that it was very, very foolish to drink good wines all the time because it ruins your palate yeah. for good wines. I'm not sure that the kind of skill he had which must have had so much judgment in it was the kind of thing that could be taught. But where he has left something of, of infinite value 
is in the standards of appreciation which his work established and which uh, remain today. That was Dr. Lua. What sort of nose did Morris have? Well, I consider he had one of the finest uh, palates and the finest, uh, the finest sense of smell of any wine man I, I've ever met. And this is Peter Clark, who is president of the Escoffier Society. I'd arranged for this monthly dinner uh, to take the form of a farewell to him. And um, his place was set, as usual, at my right hand, and we'd, his glass was turned upside down alongside his plate. And, uh, well, we were all gathered there, and despite the sherry and the white wine, well, we were talking about him, and, well, he was dead, and, and we all felt pretty miserable. Anyway, when it came to the red wine, I thought the time had come, so I stood up and called for silence and explained that tonight we were drinking only Morris's finest wines, as a gesture to his memory, and that I thought it fitting that we should uh, also drink to him, as a farewell, as it were. Well... Everybody looked suitably solemn and stood up in their place ready to drink the toast when old Charlie Moses uh, burst out with, Mor Morris might actually be here, but, uh, well, he'll be with me and I think with all of us for a long time yet. And if we're drinking his finest wines, uh, I'm sure he wouldn't like to see us looking so sad and miserable. And, uh, well, that, that did it, just, just like that. And in a moment we were all happy again and, and uh, Morris was actually back at the table with us, so much so that we all burst into a spontaneous for Morris is a jolly good fellow and drank his health and, well, that's it. Morris will be with us for a long time yet.